All right. Well, today we're here to talk about intergenerational dialogue. Every day uh, in our homes, we engage and we learn from other generations. And in the face of change and transformation, our families are an anchor from where we can uphold our transgenerational values. Today we're here to discuss um, how our families can be a platform for acceptance, for growth, for cohesion, as generation transformation comes of age. And joining me to discuss this are three remarkable women. All three of them, the only daughter of an only daughter, all three of them intrinsically, almost organically linked to the Help Center, a nonprofit organization committed to enhancing the quality of life of individuals with intellectual disabilities by giving them the opportunity to learn, live, work, and play in a safe environment. Saad Husseini, founder and board member and grandmother. <laughs> Mahal Jufali, founder, director, supervising trustee and mother. Thank you. And Dania Randur, head of therapeutic departments and daughter. <laughs> Saad and Maha co-founded the Help Center with their beloved spouse and father, Sheikh Ahmad Al Jaffali, when Dania was just one years old. Mm -hmm. And for the past 37 years, all three of them have continued to co-create and develop the impact of the center. When I spoke to the three of you, something that I found absolutely beautiful was how the story always started in your childhoods. Mm -hmm. Saad, take us back to your childhood and tell us how the story of the Help Center actually started there. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, peace. And thank you uh, for asking me to come here. And I'm delighted to see so many beautiful people here. Well, if I want to go back to my story with mentally challenged children or people, I have to go back to many, many years. Most of you have not been yet in this world. I was born in Jerusalem, Palestine in 1933. And uh, alhamdulillah, we had a beautiful life, very comfortable until the, uh, the turmoil started in the Middle East and uh, Palestine started to disappear from our country. I was a refugee. I was about 13 years old at that time. <clears throat> and uh, my family, father, mother, and my brother, Amin, we left Palestine uh, as refugees, probably, uh, to live, to go to Beirut, and from there to Damascus, back to Jerusalem, then back to Damascus. Now, what did make this feeling for me with special children, with special needs? When I was a little girl, I was about four or five years old, our neighbors next door to my house had a little beautiful little girl called Inam. Inam, I was in love with her. I must have been four or five years old, and she was exactly my height. I had to do every possible means to go every day, morning, climbing up the wall or climbing up the, the, the gates, uh, just to go and play with her. The, uh, once uh, the, um, uh, we had to live in Jaffa at that time. And uh, one day I asked, no, we had a friend of my father who came to visit us. And I said, oh, I know you. Don't you have a sister called Inan? He said, yes, but how do you know her? I said, of course, I used to play with her when I was five years old. He said, unfortunately, she passed away. I said, she cannot be. I was at that time newly married. I was 21 years old. And uh, he said, no, she, ha she must be now 30 years old. I said, impossible. She was my friend. He said, yes. But then he saw, saw that I wasn't really aware whatever difficulties she had. For me, she was the most beautiful kid I've ever seen. She was, turned out to be a Down syndrome with special features, and I loved this face ever since. Now, coming back to my life in Jeddah. When I got married in 1954, alhamdulillah, uh, my late husband helped me a lot to overcome feelings of loneliness, maybe, 
of separation of my country, of separation of my environment. And uh, he encouraged me a lot to do what I have learned in university. I have taken courses in psychology, in child care, and so on. And uh, with the help of God, really, and the support of my husband. And at that time, the late Queen Effat and some of my dear friends helped me to organize the very first women's center in Jeddah, Al Jamia Al Khairiya Al Nisaiya. There I met many, many women who had absolutely no idea about hygiene. They were Bedouin women coming from the villages nearby. Uh, they had no way of knowing how their children are being fed or so on. So we decided to have this jamia for mother and welfare children. Uh, yeah, mother and welfare children. Uh, we taught them also to, uh, how to read and write. And by that time, we opened another jamia in Jeddah, which is the Faisaliya. By that time, I was really in touch with special children, special children. Then one day I decided with my husband that it's time to open something of our own. My daughter, Maha, was just starting to... No, she already was in the third or fourth year <laughs> in, in, in university in the States. And uh, she also wanted to study the same psychology what I have studied myself. And uh, mm. when she came back to Jeddah, by that Mama. time, we have agreed with my husband, of course, after a long debate, hmm, that what we will have to do in Saudi Arabia, or especially in Jeddah, a home, not a home, but a center for treat, uh, 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 treating uh, handicapped children, children with special needs. Shall I continue your story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So the story goes on. And um, as my mother said, uh, we, she came from a very philanthropic family, married into a philanthropic family, and uh, I was a product of both mm -hmm. parents being very uh, involved in philanthropy. Uh, we decided as a family to go into uh, intellectual disabilities, and uh, that was due to the fact that when I went to, I studied in the States, I worked there, I worked in Canada and then came back, married um, with Dania in my belly. <laughs> and, um, so finally I gave birth and um, it's, um, the beauty about philanthropy and giving is people just sprout everywhere. Dr. Farida Suleiman, may she rest in peace. She was a pediatrician in Jeddah, and Dania was her client. And she told me, we have two boys, Ala and Sultan, and that's how it started. The help center started with three, two young boys and uh, two non-profit. Um, we didn't gain anything. My best friend and myself, we started working on that. Uh, going back in time, uh, my mother is the one who installed in me the giving part. Uh, she used to take me everywhere with her to the Palestinian refugee uh, building, which was just in Sharafiya next to our house. We would see all these um, children with no schools, and my mother would do all the, uh, the educational facilities for them and take them out. And, and also, as she mentioned, um, less privileged people of Saudi Arabia used to come to our house, knock our doors, and I remember they would bring um, presents to my mother and my father, aromastic dub. We had a colony of dub <laughs> or aromastics in our house, and chicken, and uh, so, which was really a nice thing, and that's how we, I, became a philanthropist. Uh, learning from my mother and father, I had to teach it to my daughter. So I learned from my mother that, okay, I'm gonna take my daughter with me. At one year, she used to come with me and, and be with the kids. She didn't know much, but, um, you know, she, you know, it's, it's you install it since you are a little baby. Mm. I'll pass it on to you, Daniel. <laughs> Continuing on. 
your point of installing it since I was young. I have very fond memories of going to the center. Um, similar to my grandmother, the kids that were around me were my friends. I didn't see any different. Children rarely see a difference in uh, the way they are and the way maybe an intellectually disabled child would be. So my journey really started at a year old when I would go for these site visits with my, pet, with my mother. Um, philanthropy, I think, is embedded in me. Uh, my idea of being in the workforce has always been to give. Um, and naturally, I think that comes from the two of them. So my life path just took me there. I also studied psychology, but majored in severe special needs education because my passion has been always to work with the children. Um, so that is where I think yeah. my life came full circle. And that was really the, the beauty of the story is, is from almost the day you open your eyes, that's something that's intrinsic to how you're raised yeah. and how, how you exist in the world. Maha, you talk about being the middle one, almost as if you were a middle child. You also happen to be the middle child in your, within your siblings. Yeah. What's the value of being the middle one? Okay, being a middle, I'm a middle between two boys and one boy. So I'm in a, a middle child with my brother Khaled. But being a middle between a mother and a daughter is a totally different thing. I, I took it to my advantage and I learned from her and I learned from her. She's the future and she's the past. So I'm constantly bombarded with information and knowledge and history and, and future thinking that it's, uh, she ignites the child within me. I mean, ever she's not now, she's old now. <laughs> but <laughs> when she was little, she ignited that. And my mother kind of settled me and made me into the person standing here today. Yeah, absolutely. And something that I also tried to poke you about, because of course when we look at different generations, when you think about it in the context of family businesses, we always hear a lot of horror stories about what happens when we go from one generation to the next. And I asked, I was trying to poke you, Dania, about this, <laughs> um, you know, like, do you feel like there's intergenerational conflict and how do you handle it? Um, but in fact, the three of you really work like a team. Teach us that lesson. So I think working with family has its challenges naturally, but um, there is a level of respect and communication that needs to happen in order for things to progress smoothly. Uh, we have a very open dialogue between the three of us when it comes to work. Um, it's also very important to try to keep work and family life at bay um, a lot of the time. Uh, so I think in answer to your question, communication would be key. Um, just communicating if you disagree with something or communicating if you agree with something. Acknowledgement is as, uh, is as powerful as disagreement, so both work. And I think for us, that's our biggest strength. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, is that you don't, you don't see these differences um, as weaknesses or something to deal with, but rather an opportunity to learn from one another. I asked you a question when I met you, and, and I'm hoping you can share the answer um, with everybody here today. I want each of you to tell me what the other has contributed mm -hmm. to the story of the Help Center. Uh, what did my daughter contribute? All the most beautiful things in the world to have a daughter, first of all. <laughs> and I'm proud of my daughter, my granddaughter. My granddaughter is here. I've got a number of them here. <laughs> and uh, well, what do I think of Maha? Maha has always been a great inspiration to me. I mean, I, of course, I started maybe this work with my ideas, but I always thought that Maha is the strength behind me. Hmm? Uh, she realized my dreams and even my visions and aspirations. Everything that I was hoping for has been hopefully realized by now. Her mind is very systematic to start with, <laughs> Mithil <Mitlil> Alman. <laughs> she's passionate, Secrets. compassionate. She's very optimistic for the future and a very happy and positive personality. Beautiful. Maha, tell Is us that about enough you. for Maha? <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> I'd be really happy if that was my mother oh my saying God. that about me. When you asked me last time, I stuttered a bit. <laughs> because uh, there's so much to say, but uh, w when I thought what would the public um, 
like to hear or benefit from what I'm going to say. I mean, she's the young one. She's, uh, she's the heart of Saudi Arabia. She's the one who's going to, her generation are going to be the one who are going to bring us up. So if we don't listen to them or I don't listen to her, I know I'm in deep trouble. So uh, she keeps me on my toes. Uh, I keep, uh, you know, I, I had to learn computers. I had to <laughs> do all of that just to keep up with Dania and her generation. So Dania is for me the, um, you know, the future. Yeah. Actually. And let's come for the circle. Well, Dania. So we Tell call our grandmother Tata. So I think without her, we wouldn't be here today. Um, she has given us the gift of giving. Uh, this is where it comes from. This is where I learned it. This is where my mom learned it. Absolutely. So that is her major and biggest contribution. Yeah, and I'm hoping that everybody here can be inspired to, to give the gift of giving. Dania, you're very, you feel very strongly about the fact that when we think about philanthropy, it's not just about donating money. It's about giving of yourself, your interests, your, the things that you know, bring you to life. Mm -hmm. um, in Saudi, um, only about 16% of the population volunteers. If we look at countries like Germany or the US, yeah. it's more than double. Give us, so give us your thoughts around how you hope to inspire people to contribute and to give back. So giving, giving the act of giving is an act of kindness. Uh, you can give anything. You can give a little part of yourself. Any small talent that you might have will benefit somebody in a very big way. It's our job when we give to understand what that person really wants. For example, in my line of work, um, if a child has an affiliation for a musical instrument or a sport, and you happen to be good in that sport or musical instrument, teaching that child how to excel in the sport or instrument is the biggest gift you can give them. Um, especially to children, financial contributions, yes, they do go a long way and they're very much appreciated in so many different ways, but sometimes you are unable to give financially. And especially in the world that we live in today, I think a lot of, of people are feeling that struggle a little bit more. So we shouldn't stop giving just due to that and, and give with the bare minimum that what you have inside. It shouldn't be something difficult or something that is overthought or, you know. Absolutely. I I ah, you had incredible <laughs> stories about Dania's um, school friends uh, coming oh, to contribute so. and then years <laughs> oh, yeah. later bringing those memories Shall I back. say that story? Okay. The story goes when uh, Dania and Rafiq, my son, and I guess Lulu was there as well. And uh, so uh, they used to go to school and the way for me, I kept on scratching my head, how am I going to get these young minds to bite into philanthropy or into intellectual disabilities? So I started going to their classrooms and just asking that question, you know, who, what would you do? What would you know, you know? And, and, the, and especially Dania's friends, many of them were very scared. We invited them to come and visit the help center and work per bono with the kids and give, you know, and no gifts allowed. They were not allowed to give gifts. And that made them think of giving in a different way, that it's not about uh, we go to the hospital, visit a child in the hospital, we give him gifts and presents and flowers. That's not philanthropy. You know, you give, you give something out of your own heart, out of your own spirit. So by that time, last, sat last Thursday, I was visited by a designer and he goes, oh, I know the help center. And I said, how do you know? I said, oh, I came and worked for you. You know, I came as a volunteer in school and I volunteered in the help center. And I'll never forget the help center. This is where it is. And, and he was 10 years old. And that image stuck in his mind because it was so real. He had to work for it. He did something to give back to the society. And it wasn't just a passing through thought or a letter or, you know, so it's, you have to make them work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, MISC of course is very much involved in the nonprofit sector Absolutely. and hopefully trying to get more of these organizations to, to um, be built and to be sustainable. And I think that community building aspect of bringing people in and taking from them what they can give and building core memories so that they grow up with this moment, uh, you know, in, in, 
in their minds yeah. that they refer to is very important. And you know, when we spoke, of course, we spoke a lot about the community that allowed you um, to make the Help Center what it is today, um, whether it be it partners, spouses, the family members, be it institutions, be it best friends, like the ones that you know, started collaborating with you in the beginning. It takes everything from the individual to the institutional to make things work. Saad, talk to us about how you managed to bring all of these people together, be it one person contributing with a bit of their time or government entities that supported you. Um, my I'll answer. Ask. Okay. Over to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So it's, it's a delicate thing to bring people, to understand people, to understand minds and make them work together. So there, is, there has to be a holistic approach to everything in life. And if you look at the bigger picture and if you look at, at, at you know, the, all the, um, the angles, uh, in life, and you you um, you work with that. That brings all the different segments of our society together, and not everybody can work with everybody. So it's up to you to figure out: Are they homogeneous? Are they going to work together? Are they going to be able to contribute? And who's going to be the leader? Who's going to be the uh, you know the the push? Who's going to be the teaser? Who's going to be so you have to find that. In philanthropy, it's very, very difficult and it's very important to find people who can work together on one line and not for themselves, for that object or person or whatever it is out there and we're all working in the same direction for the same cause. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the cause is the most important. Mm. If uh, philanthropy is something that it's with the heart, you work with your heart. Um, it's not uh, the direction that you go in has to be one. Um, and you have to continuously encourage your team around you. And uh, for yeah. us, I mean, we see the Help Center as a family. It would not be what it is today if it wasn't for the staff, the families, the mm -hmm. children. Every single person that contributes any of their time to the Help Center is what makes it what it is today. That's why it's irreparable. It <laughs> you know what I'm trying Absolutely. to say. Absolutely. Um, so it's working together for the greater cause. This is. To me, yeah, what I really learned speaking to the three of you is about this layering at every scale. It's important that you drive it. And, and I love the, the three of you as a team because I think each of you brings such a different strength, um, different ways of looking at the world, and allows you also to engage at different levels, be it inspiring individuals to contribute or bringing in uh, you know, institutions or government entity to support you at scale. And I think when you're facing such a transformational moment, um, it's very important that you're able to leverage people at every, every step of the way, but also at every scale. They each bring something different. And so the Help Center has really grown a lot uh, since it started with these two individuals that you started supporting all the way to where you are today, 200 employees um, contributing to the cause. And hopefully, you know, 37 years forward, the Help Center will continue to be here and will continue to create value and impact in the world. What is your hope, you know, uh, in 37 years? Where do you hope uh, that the Help Center is? Saad, do you want to start us off there? Okay, well, from my part of view, my, my age group, I think, I hope I have done not enough, but sufficient. <laughs> I can't do more. But my hope is with my daughter, who still has at least 10, 20 years more, and of course, my granddaughter and my other daughter, granddaughters here in the hall, they have many, many years to, to work for it, to fight for it, to what your grandfather and grandmother started, um, with the hope that it will always come back to you. Right. Philanthropy is something that comes from the heart. You can't learn it. Maybe your experiences in life will help you a little bit. But in general, it, it has to be a giving person. We were brought up, since we were little kids, to give, not to take. This was always my father and my mother's motto, give and don't expect to take. Mm -hmm. And that's what really philanthropy is. Absolutely. Even if you don't have the money for it, you don't need to have financial groups. Yeah. There was a time when we didn't have any finances, 
but we still helped a lot. I worked in schools in the university. I worked in neighborhood schools where I could perform. I could help children, refugee children, uh, to perform, to teach them, to whatever they needed, to bring them whatever they needed. And this is for me what, is, what a parent can uh, uh, impose on, on your own children. Beautiful. <clears throat> How do we continue to scale the impact, Mahal? The help center is actually, my dad was always into saying he dreamt of having a civic center. So the help center, my dream for the future of, I have two dreams, but I'll leave the other dream to <laughs> Dania, but she's going to continue that. But my dream is for the help center to become a civic center, which disseminates information, knowledge um, for free. We are privileged. We are really privileged. We are financially well off. So our foundation, the Help Center, is, is sturdy on its, ha on its legs. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can give back is by giving information and our knowledge, sharing, building societies, um, helping, empowering the parents of um, people with disabilities, with intellectual disabilities across across the world, actually, not only Saudi Arabia. So. Um, my future for the center would be for the children to be in an immersive, inclusive education, whether that be our center turns into an inclusive setting or they are fully immersed into the regular education center. This is, so in effect, it would be we would close down and turn into a civic center with the extra therapeutic department still there to give that extra bit of therapy that they need. But in terms of an educational setting, inclusion is the vision for yeah. the center going forward. What I love about that is that it's an entrepreneurial approach. You know, in the entrepreneurship circles, we always hear the sentence, disrupt yourself, mm -hmm. right? Go and find the thing that's going to kill you and build it first. Exactly. And what I loved seeing in, in how you guys are, you know, co-creating um, the future of the Help Center, but also where you brought it from, Extending it. is that it's entrepreneurial. You're constantly thinking, okay, we hope that actually what we do today is something we can't do tomorrow because we hope that it becomes integrated in the system mm -hmm. and that we have to go and now think about the next way that we can scale what we do. Uh, Maha, maybe close us off on how many people do you want to touch? How many schools do you want to turn into inclusive yeah. spaces? What's, what's your big dream? Give us a number we can hold you accountable to. <laughs> Infinity. <laughs> but I know I can't do it. I need you all to do it with us. We're one hand, we're there, we have one hand up. We need to all work together. It's for the greater good. It's, um, it's philanthropy. We can't gain, but we can regain it in here, you know, and, no and brownie income. up there. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much thank to you. the three thank of you. you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. We're going to be taking applications for volunteering outside <laughs> if anyone yes, wants please. to join the cause. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you.